you done now. Hi, everybody. This is Bob Gale, co-creator of Back to the Future, and you're listening to Brad Gilmore. Doc! 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 Okay, relax, Doc. It's me. It's me. It's Martin. Oh, I can't be. I just sent you back to the future. Yeah. Oh, I know you did send me back to the future, but I'm back. I'm back from the future. Great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine? Kind of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it some style? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the season finale of Back to the Future, the podcast, season nine. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and this is the only podcast looking back in time at the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. We find ourselves in a familiar position. We are wrapping up season nine of the show, and we're going to do so with a bang. Several things happening on the show today, if you can't already find that out by the show's title, We are going to do a full, literally, the whole movie watch-along commentary and trivia sesh at the end of the podcast today to to wrap us up here in this lovely season. We're also going to do something called the Rewatchables Back to the Future Part 3, where I kind of go through a categories list, several categories, and I tell you what I think about uh, or what my answer is for each of the categories for this movie. We're going to do that prior to watching the film together. And also, never thought this would happen, but I got a uh, phone call the other day, and very there quickly, I actually got an email followed by a phone call, and very quickly thereafter, I heard uh, this on the other end of the phone. Hey, Brad, what's going on? That is the voice of the legend, the host of The Tonight Show, former host of The Tonight Show, Jay Leno. Uh, he has his new program, Leno's Garage, of course, that's premiering at the same day that most of you are listening to this on September the 7th. That's this Monday. Uh, but in, in 2022, it's this Wednesday. And uh, he was promoting his show, and we started to talk about what else? The DeLorean. And he had Doc Brown's Time Machine on an episode of Jay's Garage. I think Joe Walser was actually on that episode. And... Um, we talked about it as well as other things with cars and comedy and the Tonight Show and things of that nature. So I said, holy hell, why not have season nine have two different episodes with two hosts of the Tonight Show on it? So Jimmy Fallon uh, came in as a substitute for this season, which I can't believe I'm saying, uh, because we were going to do the Laker Jim podcast, uh, the Fletchcast that day or that week and we just couldn't make the schedules work it was planned but things changed at the last second so i had to come up with another episode happened to do the jimmy fallon episode uh, interview and it all worked out and i think it came out to be a really fun episode for the season but jay leno joins us so i thought what better way to go out with a bang than a man who knows a thing or two about a season finale uh and a series premiere at the same time season season premiere and a season finale on the same day Jay Leno is going to help us close out season nine of Back to the Future, the podcast, as he uh, starts up season, I don't know what season it is of Jay Leno's Garage, but it's a new season of Jay Leno's Garage on CNBC. Check your local listings. Hit that DVR button. It's a fun show. I already saw the episode um, before it came out. It was, you know, Alfonso Rivera's on there, Carlton Banks, of course, uh, Brie Larson, which should change her name to Bay Larson. She's, she's a she mighty, mighty fine. Mighty fun. <laughs> but I'm rambling. Guys, I just want to give you a big shout out, all of you. Thank you so much for supporting Back to the Future, the podcast, each and every single week that we've done this, each and every single season. Some of you have been with me since the beginning, since 2015. You've listened to my voice. And first of all, God bless you for doing so. Uh, but you've listened to my voice. We've had a really good time. We've had a fun time. And I'm looking forward to continuing that in season 10 of the podcast. But uh, right now, I want to tell you what uh, P. Grabbin once said. Very fun. Love the behind the scenes. So interesting to hear all the stories and details I never knew happened. MJF was not the original Marty. Loved hearing from the special effects guys. So professional, detailed, amazing experiences. 
Thank you for leaving that review, and I hope that you can leave one for Season 9 of the podcast. Please let me know what you thought of Season 9, and I will pick out one of those reviews. We'll do a special time capsule, and I'm going to send you a copy of both of my books, Back from the Future and Bond, James Bond. But guys, it is now time to start Season 9 finale of Back to the Future, the podcast with Jay Leno. And he joins me right now to talk about the new season of Leno's Garage premiering tonight when you're listening to this, uh, September the 7th on CNBC. The legendary host of The Tonight Show, Jay Leno, joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, it's telling a few jokes. You're trying to make a living. You know, it's like 110 here in L.A. It's pretty crazy. How's the weather there? Well, you know, we're in Houston, Texas, so this morning it starts off at 100, then it'll go down to 75, then it'll rain for about two hours, and then it'll be back up to 100. That's pretty much our daily routine. Well, like the government said on the news today, he said, turn your air conditioner, to say to you, turn your air conditioner to 78 degrees. Okay, 78 degrees is not air conditioning. That's called heating. <laughs> You're absolutely okay. right. It's not, it's not you don't put your air conditioner on 78 degrees. It just makes me laugh. But yeah, no, the show premieres tonight. We're pretty excited. We got a uh, pretty good cast of characters. We got Elon Musk. We got President Biden on the show. Kelly Clarkson, the Idol Pitbull, Danica Patrick. I mean, all kinds of folks. Tony Hawk, Mike Rowe, Jim, Jim Jeffries is on. He's really funny. Uh, yeah, just, just an interesting cross section of people. You know, anything that rolls, explodes, and makes noise, that's pretty much what the show is about. Well, I love the show. I love Leno's Garage because, I mean, it has the history element to it. You get to see some awesome cars. You learn more about them. You have fun with the celebrities. Um, and, you know, I was actually, I just bought a new truck not too long ago because I think it's legally required that if you live in Texas, you have to drive a truck. And Yeah, when, that's the law. It's the law. It's the law. I can't do anything about it. Um, but when I was there at the dealership, I saw that Ford Lightning the Ford F-150 Lightning, which is the all-electric Ford. And although it was right. way out of my price range, the thing was incredible. And I saw in a clip, I think that you you feature the the Lightning on your show this season, right? You know, the great, it's amazing. You could weld on that truck. It's got 240. It's got 240 on it. I mean, you've got, you can power your house for three days. You know, you, know, when you guys down there in Texas had that, that, that big freeze about the last winter. Uh, the Ford dealers gave out lightnings to everybody just take them home plug your house in it's one of the greatest marketing trick ever because it made diehard customers out of those people but you can you could run your house for three days you know and if there's some sort of power outage you know so yeah it, it's it's really a well thought out product you know I, I i was driving a truck the other day and i noticed the window sticker on it said 12 miles per gallon and, and i thought that's on the window sticker that's the best you're going to do. You know, that's going downhill with a Japanese hunger striker driving naked and touching the gas with his big toe, and you only get 12. So the electric truck, I think, is really going to be a, a pretty amazing thing. I mean, electric cars in general, my mother-in-law has a Tesla, and, and there's 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 some getting used to it, like getting used to the way that the car drives. But overall, I think that we're going to, I mean, we're seeing it now. We're going to have more and more and more of them. I just saw the DeLorean is back. The DeLorean is back and has a uh, all electric model. Have you seen that one? Because I know you had Doc Brown's time machine on Leno's garage before. Have you seen this new right. DeLorean? DeLorean was it would follow the white line down the road if you get the joke. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know I was a DeLorean, a John DeLorean fan when I was a kid, and then when he turned out to be a sleazy coke dealer, I just kind of said, "Okay, thank you, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this guy." Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, a big thing now. You find uh, sort of classic brands and you try to bring them back as an electrified version. And that might work. We'll see what happens because the car, the engine that was in that DeLorean wasn't very good. That was sort of the problem. It just wasn't a very good car to begin with. So maybe an electrified version might, might be better. So, so we'll see. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I mean, nobody expected it to happen this fast. I mean, it's as little as 10 or 15 years ago, people said, It'll take 50 to 60 years to get people to switch to electric cars. Well, now it's probably going to happen by by 2030. Cadillac's not even going to make a gas car. And same with Buick. You know, they'll all be electric. Yeah, it's incredible how, how fast you're right, how fast it's come on. And this show, Leno's Garage, again, it's so much fun to watch. You had Brie Larson on, on, the, on the debut edition of the show. Um, but also, 
Sure. I have to be quite frank with you. I, you know, love your version of The Tonight Show. I just loved you on The Tonight Show. Your monologue was can't miss television. My parents let me stay up late to watch it um, just because you made everybody feel good. And, and you know what? You didn't alienate anybody in your audience. And I just kind of wanted to know, how did you accomplish that? Like everybody liked Jay Leno. You could turn it on and you had a joke for everybody. Well, uh, yeah, you know, it's just funny because we sold this show and every show I do on the basis of no politics, you know? It's all just jokes. I mean, Rodney Dangerfield is a close friend of mine. I knew Rodney for 40 years, funniest man alive. I have no idea who he voted for. <laughs> I have no idea how he felt about <laughs> any political issue because we never discussed it, you know? And when you take politics out of the mix, it's amazing how well people can get along. You know, it, it because there are people I like and they, I don't have to, I don't have to agree with everybody to like them, you know. But everything is so polarizing now. You know, it's so funny. If you have a talk show now and you don't give your opinion on every issue, oh my God, people just come after you, and it's it's pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean that was the fun part about doing the show when I did it because you get angry letters from us that, well, Mr. Leonard, you and your Republican friends, I hope you, like, well, Mr. Leonard, you and your Democratic buddies, I hope you know. Anyway, and the same day you get hate mail from each side, and you go, oh, good, they're both mad. This is perfect. I'm doing something right. I mean, it's okay to make fun of the president, but, you know, you don't have to, like you said, give your opinion on, on every political topic of the day. Um, that's what I always appreciated about your Tonight Show. Uh, more, more than, you know, the, like you said, the shows today, you have to. It's just the, politiliza the politicalization of well, the yeah, society. Now, where people want to hear the joke first to see if they agree with it before they laugh at it. Know. Well, how has that you how know. has that changed for you doing stand up? I mean, because you do great stand up, people regard you as one of the greatest stand ups of all time. Uh, do you feel that audiences are a little bit more tense? They look around and make sure it's okay to laugh at a joke before they laugh at it. Well, but you do get that a little bit, but for the most part, you know, uh, like you said, if you don't go there, you're fine. I mean, I I like political comics. If that's what I want to hear, I'll go hear politics. I hate it when I go to a show and a celebrity gives me a lecture on some issue. I go, guys, that's not why I'm here. That's not why I bought a ticket, you know. So your first job is to entertain, you know. Uh, I mean, I always tell performers, look, people will figure out your politics very quickly, okay? Whether you know it or not, everything you do is a clue. So don't worry about this. Just make it as funny as you can or as good of music as you can. And, and it's the same that most people go to a show to get away from that, you know. And that's what we try to do on this show. It's, you know, we don't really have, you know, I get celebrities because I call them up and I go, look, we want to do the show. And they go, no, I go, look, I don't care about your drug bust. I don't care about your bad divorce. I don't care if you're fooling around. We're not talking about that. We're talking about cars. We're talking about how did the automobile play an influence in your life in some way. And you, you try to find that angle on it. And and they all come on because they know they're not going to get, I'm not going to hang them out to dry. You know? Well, let me ask you this. I mean, you say the automobiles that impacted your life. What, I know it's hard because I think you have several garages full of hundreds of cars or, or dozens of cars of all kinds. What one automobile impacted your life more than any other? Well, you know, when I came to Los Angeles, I, one day I just got on a plane, I came here, and I landed at the airport, and I picked up the penny saver, and I said, uh, i, I got to find a car. So I flipped through the penny saver, I was sitting at the airport, and I saw a 55 Buick, and I said, Winchester, California, where is that? So I went up to that guy, anybody know Winchester? And the guy goes, yeah, it's like six miles from here. I said, oh, okay. And, you know, being a kid, I was just so stupid. I said, I'll go over there, I'll buy that Buick, and I'll have a car, you know. So I took a cab <laughs> with my suitcase. I got out of the cab and uh, I go to the guy's house. He got a Buick for sale. Yeah. Guys, you want to see it? And I look and I go, oh, okay, I'll buy it. And the guy goes, oh, well, all right. I, I said, does it run? He goes, yeah, it runs okay. And it ran okay. And I bought it. And since it's such a big car, I also had a place to live, you know. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I got, I mean, it was just so stupid. I, I, I don't know why I thought I bought it. It was actually cheaper to just buy the first car that I saw because I couldn't afford to drive around and take cabs and look at cars all day. And I still have that 55 years. I met my wife in that car. I took it to my first tonight show. I took it to my last tonight show. Um, 
yeah, I, I still got it except in my garage. So I have a lot of memories of that. I mean, a wife, a story my wife hates. And it's the first place we ever were, let's say, intimate. <laughs> okay. And on our 25th anniversary, I said, oh, let's, let's, let's reenact our first date in this car. You know, okay. So we tried to find the place where we parked, which was secluded at the time, but now it's a housing development. So it was like two o'clock and I said, oh, this looks like about the area. So, you know, and your 25th wedding anniversary, so you're not quite as nimble as you were as a kid, you know, and her hair got stuck in the horn ring and beep, and then I, I, I turned down a porch light and came out and I'm like half dressed, excuse me, sorry, sorry, excuse me. So it wasn't as good as the first time, but you get the idea. <laughs> Well, you definitely get the idea. What a picture you just painted. Uh, you can see vehicles like Jay's describing on Leno's Garage. The premiere is tonight on CNBC. Jay, thank you so much. I've been a longtime fan of yours, and it's an honor just to talk to you for a couple minutes. Thank you, sir. All right, all right. We've gone from Jay Leno. Now we are here. We are here to talk about the uh, the rewatchable movie that is Back to the Future Part 3. Um, I've said for a long time, and you'll hear uh, in the commentary track that we do as a bonus to this episode, I've always loved the third one. I've always had a connection to the third one. I distinctly remember going to Blockbuster, renting the third one again and again and again and again. I've said for a long time on this podcast. I don't know if it's because I live in Texas. I, I don't know what the reason really is. But I just love Back to the Future 3. I just do. Um, it's been my favorite a lot of the time. Sometimes something supersedes it. But for the most part, the uh, Back to the Future 3, the third part, has always been my favorite. So... For fans of Bill Simmons, which I'm sure there are some cross-sections out there who are aware of Bill Simmons, big sports guy, sports writer, worked for ESPN for a while, then has done his own thing with The Ringer. They have a great podcast that I suggest everybody go check out called The Rewatchables, and it's where they talk about movies that they find to be rewatchable. Now, not all these movies are Academy Award-winning blockbusters. Some of them are smaller movies. Some of them are bad movies from the 80s that turned out to be really good with, with time, uh, like Tango and Cash, which is actually one that I kind of like. So they go, they go through all these movies, but they have categories that they, that they follow the rules of. And there's several categories, and I'm going to go through the category list, explain what they are, and then I'm going to give you my rewatchables version of Back to the Future 3 my answers to these categories. So the categories are most rewatchable scene, best quote, and I want you to think about what your answers to this question would be and, and tweet me. I would love to hear or email me. Uh, Brad.Gilmore. Actually, no, I'm sorry. It's Brad Gilmore at can'twaitforever.com. Brad Gilmore at can'twaitforever.com. If you ever want to email me, that's where you can find me. I put it out in the public. So I want you to think about your answers as you hear these. Most rewatchable scene, Best quote, what aged the best? What aged the worst? The Dion Waiters Award, which is a heat check performance. I'll explain that when I get to it. The Overacting Award, Casting What Ifs, Half-Assed Internet Research, which we're actually not going to pay attention to that category. I'll explain why in a minute. Unanswerable Questions, Could This Be Made as a 10-episode Netflix series, Apex Mountain, and Who Won the movie. Uh, also, there's recasting couch and is this movie better with? And we'll get to some of that, but I'm going to go through my answers. For what age, the best, what age, the worst, and so on and so forth. Okay, And some of these answers might be controversial, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm being me. These are my honest opinions. You all know I love Back to the Future, so I don't have to defend myself too much on this. But some of these, uh, you know, you might be shocked by. So let's start with the easy one. Most rewatchable scene from Back to the Future Part 3. Look, I, I could choose from a ton. Because I think every part of all three of these movies is rewatchable. But for me, I narrowed it down to two. One of them is Doc's return at the end of the movie where he comes back to Hill Valley. 
on the train tracks with the time machine train. But the most rewatchable scene of Back to the Future Part 3 is the duel between Marty and Doc. Time's up, run! Here to meet your makeup, Lexman. Right here, Tannen! I thought we could settle this like men. You thought wrong, dude. You know what I think? Mm. I think Buford's going to jail. <laughs> Get him out of that <laughs> Get him! Buford Tannen, you're under arrest for robbing the Pine City stage. You got anything to say? To me, there's so many quotables in here. Uh, even the, the prelude to that where he's like, forfeit? What's forfeit mean? Well, it means you, you win without a fight. Hey, you can't do that, Run. It's like, what do you mean you can't do it? <laughs> I don't think there are official rules to a duel. Um, love the bulletproof vest with the Call back to Back to the Future Part 2, where they're watching the man with no name from the Fistful of Dollars trilogy. Um, and, and Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood has a bulletproof vest. And in Back to the Future 3, as far as the citizens of Hill Valley are, are concerned, Clint Eastwood has a bulletproof vest on. I think that's the most rewatchable scene in the movie. I've, I thought about a few others. I love where they're chasing Clara when she's heading to Clayton Ravine, Shonash Ravine at the time. I love that one. It, it came close, but the return for Doc was really cool. But I think the best one is, without a doubt, the Biff and Marty duel. Most rewatchable scene from Back to the Future Part 2. Best quote from the movie. This one had a lot more contenders than I thought. But for me, the best quote is... Well, let me give you, let me give you some of my runners up. 
Uh, Doc asked Marty, what idiot dressed you in that outfit? Marty says, you did. Love it. That one made me laugh. The other one that I like is where he says, Doc, uh, Doc says, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. And Marty's like, right, right. I have a real problem with that. That's a great one. My third choice was going to be, so maybe it might not be my name that's supposed to end up on that tombstone. It may be yours. And then Marty goes, great, great, Scott. And Doc goes, I know this is heavy. All great options. But the best quote from the movie is when they're about to commandeer the locomotive and the engineer goes, is this a holdup? And Doc looks at Marty, looks back. It's a science experiment. Oh, come on now. Phenomenal piece of business. Phenomenal piece of business, Doc. That's my mo- best quote. What's yours? What age the best? This is an easy one. Leah Thompson. I mean, right? Can we have just a round of applause for, for Leah Thompson? Beautiful woman. Talented director. Activist. Overall incredible human being. And she called me a dreamboat. That really happened. She, she told that to me. So, she aged the best. What aged the worst? Here might be some controversy for me. The thing that aged the worst in Back to the Future Part 3 oh, is the time travel train. I know, I know, you might not agree with me, but it's true. That time travel train that I can barely say did not age the best. It aged the worst out of the whole movie. Now, does it ruin the movie for me? Not even close. Do I still like the time train? Yes, I do. Does it make you go, hmm, have we jumped the shark here? Have we? A little bit. I think it just, it stands out like such a sore thumb. And I know that this might have been explained in the comics or cartoon series. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a comic book reader, um, so I'm going to have to cross-reference this with Norm uh, Benford and the cartoon series I haven't seen in a long time since I did the book, so I need to go back and watch it. But it is so jarring to see that time train and all the little doodads that it has on it. We don't really get a good explanation. When did Doc invent this? How did he do it? What happened? These are the unanswerable questions, and we're going to get to that. But there's so many questions I have about the time train. And then when you see it every time, it kind of it gets that jump the shark. Uh, this is this is bordering on a bit corny. Now, do I love it? Yes, I do. But I just had to answer the question of what age is the worst. And to me, that was the one. The Dion Waiters Award for a heat check performance. So this is like an actor who had a one-off scene and kills it. Or, or it just shows up for a little bit. And you can count on them for a corner three. The Dion Waiters Award for Back to the Future Part 3, it goes to Burton Gillum. Yes, yeah. I mean, Burton, come on, man. A cult peacemaker. I want everybody to know the, the gun that killed Mad Dog Tannen was a cult peacemaker. It's just phenomenal. What up, Burton? I need to text Burton, by the way. I, I've been meaning to do that. Hope you're well, my friend, up there in Dallas, Texas. Casting what ifs. Now, I did some internet research here trying to find a couple casting what ifs. There there are some. There are some. Uh, We know that the mayor, Mayor Hubert, was supposed to be played. And if you don't know this, this might actually blow your mind. Mayor Hubert was supposed to be played by the former president of the United States. Ronald Reagan as a callback to the joke from the first movie. Reagan, it would have been Reagan's first uh, movie in like 30 years, I think they said, but he, uh, they didn't make it work. They didn't make it work. So he did not play the mayor and it would have made sense for him to be the mayor. because He's the president. He's a governor. Why not be a mayor of a California town? I mean, oh, so good. Um, Casting what ifs. Michael J. Fox was not originally cast to play Seamus McFly. It was supposed to be Crispin Glover. 
Crispin Glover was supposed to be Seamus. Um, had Crispin not had his issues with the production for whatever reason, not for me to hypothesize about. He's talked about it. Gail's talked about it. I'm leaving it at that. But if Crispin had continued on, I could have definitely seen him playing this part. And um, who knows what else he would have played. But those are my casting what ifs of what I found. Unanswerable questions. I have some. But they really revolve around the time train. When did Doc create this? How did he do it? It's steam. So we know that's how he got up to the 88. But all the other things. The flux capacitor. How do you get a Mr. Fusion to power the time circuits? What? Wh- how do you go to a time train? Because what if you travel to a point in time where there are no tracks? What do you do? I know he has the hover conversion there. So I guess that would be my option. But... You can't just have a huge locomotive. And you know how they could hide the DeLorean in Back to the Future 1, 2, and 3? You could kind of hide it in the shop or behind the Hill Valley or behind the um, Lion Estate sign. How the hell are you going to hide a time train? And especially one that flies. What would have been great is if they go, like, you know, back into, you know, Roswell times, which I guess would have been the 50s. So, But still, like that was the inciting incident that started the UFO stuff. That, that would have kind of been cool, but they don't travel through space, just through time. Unanswerable questions all around it. My other one is, what did everybody think when all of a sudden Doc Brown just isn't around anymore and Clara, the school teacher, the blacksmith of Hill Valley, and their two children are just gone? What does everyone think? You know, and my other unanswerable question is, was it enough for Marty to punch Biff Tannen, right? Punch him in the mouth. He goes into manure. And then as far as the townspeople know, he falls off a cliff into Shonash Ravine on the locomotive Was that enough to rename the ravine after him? Was it? I mean, was it? I don't know. Because when he comes back to 1985, it's Eastwood Ravine. They knew this guy for a couple of days. Uh, You know, maybe. Maybe. But it's an unanswerable question. Was it enough? The townspeople of Hill Valley would have to tell me. Could this be remade as a 10-episode Netflix series? This movie... (laughs) Absolutely not. The trilogy? Absolutely so. I could see this as a Netflix series. And I know the guys from Cobra Kai have talked about that a lot, of wanting to make this into a series. Bob Gale says, "Ah, not going to happen. Not that I'm disagreeing with him, but could it? Yes, absolutely. Apex Mountain. So this is an actor or a director of some kind who uh, never got any higher than this. This was the, not not that they didn't get higher, but this was the top. This was the peak. We peaked here. This is the 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 the, the uh, most famous, most notoriety, biggest. You know, whatever. Apex Mountain. I got a couple for Apex Mountain. I have Christopher Lloyd is at Apex Mountain. You know, he's always known as the Doc. When he does signings, he's the Doc. People aren't checking for Uncle Fester, although I would, or the Page Master, although I would, or even Jim Ignatowski, although I would. They're ch- or Professor Plum, you know this, sure as hell I would. They're checking for Doc Brown, and um, that's his apex mountain, Chris Lloyd. Same with Michael J. Fox, I think. Although he did spin City, people still want to see Marty McFly, and that's, this is no disrespect to what they've been able to do as actors because they're incredible. And I love everything that Michael J. Fox and Chris Lloyd have done post Back to the Future. Literally, even my favorite Martian, it gets gets rewatches from me. However, um, this this is their this is their apex. Now we have one more apex mountain. Continuing our apex mountain, it's Bob Gale. Bob Gale gave us the greatest trilogy ever made, and it's hard. To come back from that. 
It's hard to do anything bigger than the greatest ever, right? Um, Robert Zemeckis, not on Apex Mountain, because he gave us, he had such a great run. He had such a great run for about, I mean, he's still going on a great run. He has Pinocchio coming out this week with Tom Hanks. But think about this run. And this is off top, so if I get one out of order, forgive me. But it, it was essentially Romancing the Stone, Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Back to the Future 2, Back to the Future 3, Death Becomes Her, Forrest Gump, Castaway, and The Polar Express. Come on now. That's, that's a run. That is a run. And very few people get a 10-year, 15-year uh, run like that, 20-year run. That's crazy, and he's still going, still making great movies. I'm excited for Pinocchio. That's my Apex Mountain, okay? Last couple last couple that we have here. Um, I lost my place. Who won the movie? We did. No, who won the movie? Mary Steenburgen. Best part of this movie is Mary Steenburgen. She's phenomenal as Claire. What a great addition to the cast. Finally, also like a companion of either Doc or Marty that has something very meaningful. Uh, meaningful scenes, meaningful dialogue, big moments, changes the course of the film. You know, she's not just stuck in an alleyway for the majority of the movie or on a bench, right? Um, Picking nits. Why didn't Doc just take Clara to show her the time machine when she didn't believe him? He, she, he could have just said, come, look, I'll show you. I have it in my office, in my blacksmith shop. I don't get that. Recasting couch. I think this movie's perfectly cast. It's hard to do that. Is this movie better with Danny Trejo, Steve Buscemi, or Michael K. Williams in it? Uh, no. Knocks it out of the park for me. But that's my rewatchables of Back to the Future Part 3. This has been an incredible season, uh, season nine of Back to the Future, the podcast. I am planning at the moment you're hearing this. I'll go ahead and announce it. Um, it might take a while, though, for you to actually get the podcast, but it is in the works. I'm doing a Clue the Movie rewatch minute by minute uh, with someone very special, and I'm, I'm working on that project right now. There's, there's a ton of podcasts that I'm actually going to be rolling out here soon, but this is the season finale of Back to the Future, the podcast season nine. You might say, wait a minute, why is he wrapping up? I thought that we had more. You do have more. So what we're about to do, we're going to transition into my watch-along commentary for Back to the Future part three. I hope that you enjoy that. It was fun to do it. It's weird to just watch a movie and talk into a microphone by yourself. I've done it before. Odd. So uh, if you want to watch along with me, that'd be the best way to do this. Watch the show with me. Watch the movie with me as we do it. Um, but let's get to it right now. Here's my commentary for Back to the Future Part 3. All right, guys, it is time. It is time to get into it. So right now I have Back to the Future Part 3 pulled up. I have it pulled up on my Amazon Prime. And we're doing Back to the Future the three Part 3 this season because I've actually promised this uh, rewatch for a long time. We're going to go back to Back to the Future Part 2 uh, probably in Season 10 and do one of these where I sit and watch the movie by myself. But if you want to hear a breakdown of Back to the Future Part 2, you can in Season 2, I believe, or 3, 2, Season 2 of Back to the Future, the podcast. Me, Norm, and Davy Davey Boy Mitch, we um, 
broke that down. But right now, I have Amazon Prime pulled up. I'm going to get my laptop out just in case there are any things I need to research, as they say. And I'm going to do a little countdown. If you want to watch along with me, this is the moment to do it. We're going to do a little countdown here. I'm going to press play. I have a runtime of one hour, 58 minutes, and 18 seconds. And we're going to get into it here in five, four, three, two, one. I am pushing play. All right here. I wonder what we are going to see. So right now we see the Universal Presents. Hold on. Cut this out. Cut this out. I want subtitles on. All right, All right guys. I'm pushing play right now. And there we see the Universal Pictures logo, kind of the old school one. I actually always liked when they did this. This always made me feel happy, like I was on a journey with everyone. Now, I'm going to kind of fade in and out when I'm talking while we're watching this. Some scenes I'll lay out on, some I will just watch right along. I hope you can't hear the bleed through of the audio, but uh, we're going to get things started here. Back to the Future Part 3. I'm excited. The 75th anniversary. All right, starting off here. Here's our first title credit, of course, Steven Spielberg, a Robert Zemeckis film. These are things that we know. Interestingly enough, if um, you aren't aware, they wrote Back to the Future 2 and 3 at the same time. It was called Paradox, but now here we are. Saturday, November 12th, 1955. This scene of Doc Brown and Marty McFly from the first movie where Marty's going to hit the wire from the lightning bolt and Doc slides down from the clock tower. The only sequence that you see in all three Back to the Future movies. There's the lightning. Oh, Always, this is always, no matter how many times I've seen these movies, this scene still resonates with me more than the rest of them. Like, I always feel the drama of the moment. And for a movie I've seen a hundred times or more, like, and I'm not even exaggerating, at least a hundred times I've seen each of these movies. I've probably seen Back to the Future one the most, but they're pretty evenly distributed. And this scene always gets me. And then coming from Back to the Future 2, this scene right here is great. Where Marty takes the, the left turn, runs down the fire trails, full speed. There's a big line coming up here for me here in a second. Right here. When Marty says I'm back from the future, that's where I got the title for my book. The Faint. See, in part two, we saw the, the credits there. Now we're getting opening credits of part three. The final entry. This rainfall was fun. So there's the Gamble House in uh, Pasadena, 1640 Riverside Drive. Beautiful old car. That Gamble House, if you want to learn more about it, we talked about it on the podcast in season seven, I think, with uh, Jennifer Trotu. She's the curator of the, the Gamble House Museum. James Tolkien, Mark McClure, Wendy Jo Sperber return. Leah Thompson, of course, not as uh, who you think, Ryan. Just a beautiful shot. 
slowly panning to the front of the house. You see the the white vehicle double back by Texas's own ZZ Top, Houston, Texas, and the building. There you see the three letters drying by the fire that Doc wrote Marty along with his socks and his leather jacket. He wanted to get something conspicuous, inconspicuous. This is such a great shot. Wow. I actually think that the openings of each of these movies is what I enjoy the most, (laughs) right? Each movie opens with a great shot. So Doc's going through it right now. I just want to let everyone know that Copernicus in this film is portrayed by the dog Foster. Foster was the name of the dog that portrayed Copernicus in this particular scene. Oh. No one can do over the top campy reactions better than Chris Lloyd. And I actually mean that as the biggest compliment in the world. Oh, this is great right here. Boom. This breakdown by Marty is classic. The one thing I, I will say that's always stuck out to me about the movies, and, and and when you do one of these rewatches, you kind of look for look for Nick Picks, right? Calls him Future Boy again. The one thing that always did stand out to me is the age of Michael J. Fox from one film to the other. Like Tom Wilson, Chris Lloyd, Leah Thompson, all aged beautifully. And I'm not saying Michael J. Fox looks bad by any stretch of the imagination, but he doesn't look like he's you know, a 17-year-old. He looks like 28. There you see the model still there in Doc's laboratory of Hill Valley when they're doing the the experiment. There's the uh, mind-reading device. What a crazy, I mean, obviously these movies aren't based in something that could actually happen, at least not yet, but reading a letter that you wrote, you're reading a letter you wrote after you wrote it, but before you knew that you wrote it, and you actually wrote it in the past and not seeing it until the future, but it was your future self that wrote it in the past. I mean, come on now, this must be a mind trip. There's the line, the title of the movie.
Now, on the Amazon Prime version of this movie, they do have the feature called X-Ray, um, which is the trivia really piped in from IMDb. So I might read a few of those as they come up if I find them interesting. September 1st, 1885. That's a, uh, a day. Uh, that was yesterday at the time I'm recording this, September 1st, 2022. I know some people are, boom, look at that. Blow up the, line, the mine, the Delgado mine. Um, Can you see the Emmett Brown tombstone yet? No, I think it's out of focus. Foster was cute, man. So this was filmed in China Flat, Oak Park, Ventura County, California. So I know people sometimes are, are adverse to this movie because it's a Western and they don't like the fact that it it see, it does, like in all actuality, it does seem like a departure from the other two movies. But I think that um, even if you don't like Back to the Future 3 as much, and even if you look at box office receipts, it's it's the least performing of the three. Personally, on most days, it's my favorite. Christopher Lloyd said on this show it was his favorite when I interviewed him. Um, but this first 20 to 30 minutes is pretty awesome, even if you don't like all the Western part. So this was the first... Uh, Tip to uh, Jules Verne, and that's going to come back several times. Again, Bob Gale and, and Zemeckis, when they write these movies, they do such a good job of of putting lines in there. They're going to play back later in the movie. So you can all, almost every piece of dialogue from any of the three Back to the Future films pays off, almost every one of them. reason that's unbelievable this is 1955 this is 10 years after world war ii yeah and you're about to, Doc. It's what we call foreshadowing. See, this is what I'm telling you now. This happens to be one of those instant payoffs where they set up the dialogue. So, obviously, this is where it starts to come into play that Doc Brown is um, the focus of this film. We spent a lot of time with him. We're learning more about him. There's our first shot of Buford Mad Dog Tannen, as portrayed by Tom Wilson, who is the best actor in the three films for the roles that he had to do. 
But this is where it started to come into play that this movie was, um, this movie was Doc's story. And it's said that Zemeckis, beautiful shot of the library there. It's said uh, that Zemeckis and Gale thought that they had already done everything they could do with William McFly and family, as you see here, with Marty's family. So they decided, let's let's focus on Doc. Let's see what old Doc's about. probably because of a German connection. And there's the picture of Doc. The new clock, September 5th, 1885. Ironically, the day this episode is going to be coming out. Marty looks like such a badass in the movie. So here's my personal favorite uh, look of the DeLorean. Probably because I just love this movie so much. But this, the Western white walled tire DeLorean is beautiful. And um, the white walls is one of those that um, we did finally get fully restored by Joe Walser uh, several years, obviously, after the movies came out. But it was fully restored. It took Joe Walser, according to this, six to seven years um, to finish the white wall restoration. It was done in 2011. We got the mention of Clint Eastwood there. Call back. Where you're going, there are no roads, literally. I love Doc's shirt. Oh my gosh, I want that shirt. Now, it took filmmakers, um, this, these movies were shot over 11 months, and um took two years, about, for them to finish all the sets and get ready. The pre-production on these movies was massive. I remember these scripts were being written and finished, and this movie w was being filmed, and the, he was trying, he being Robert Zemeckis, just finishing up Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which Christopher Lloyd is also in. Going all the way here. And the Indians, as we say, now Native Americans are there. Them white walls are really letting them go. By the way, they, they unveiled that new DeLorean. Has anyone seen it? The Alpha 5? How do y'all feel about the red color? Tweet me at Brad Gilmore. I'm not a fan of the red. I'll be honest with you. 
when I visited the, the, the DeLorean Motor Company, they had a red old school DeLorean, you know, like the 81 model in there. And I had never seen that before. And I didn't like it then. And I don't like it in 2022. So in Back to the Future 1, I always say that one and three are the most alike because Marty and Doc are stuck in the past. They have to get back to the future and they don't have the clear way to do so because of the technology of the time. In 1955, it was no, uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, uh, plutonium. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't think of that. No plutonium. And here in 1885, we're about to learn the reason why he couldn't get back here. And again, Marty neither time realizes it because why? He's a kid. He's a kid in high school. He's not going to think about, oh, what do you mean? They don't have a plutonium here? Have the picture of the of the Doc Brown tombstone. They do two things, right? One, show Doc what happens, and two, give us something to change, like the newspapers. And there it is. Okay, the the fuel line is ripped. And I always thought you see it leaking out. If he would have grabbed the ten gallon hat or whatever, I guess he didn't have time because the bear's there. So a lot of people always think too, like, okay, Back to the Future 1, he goes back 30 years, and Back to the Future 2, he goes forward 30 years, and they're like, and Back to the Future 3, he goes back 100 years, because the movie takes place in 85, but really, he goes from 55 to 85, 1885 is 70 years. Pan up. We're introduced to Seamus McFly, which, depending on who you ask, and if I ever get a chance to talk to Bob Gale again, I, I'd like for him to have clarification on it. Maybe the, it is out there. I'd like to know. But Seamus McFly was a, originally, supposedly going to be Crispin Glover, which I actually can't see. Leah Thompson's Irish accent is way better than Michael J. Fox's. Love to the legend, but I'm just saying. Um, he does not recognize that Maggie McFly looks strikingly similar to his mother. I know people, this is another one that people point out as this is an issue, right? How could, you know, Leah Thompson, how could Mrs. McFly, so his great great-grandmother or whatever it is, how could she look exactly like his mother of the future? It's not from the same side of the family. I get all that. But come on, it's Leah Thompson. Do you not want her in the movie? Do you not want her in the movie? No, I think we want Leah Thompson in the movie. When I was a kid and was watching this movie, he's about to do the thing where he spits out the, uh, I think the split cam there is awesome. I truly believed Seamus was handing him the plate. And I know at IL ILM, when they pulled that shot off, they were like, we are industrial light and magic. Because it's such an awesome shot, but it goes over the normal people's heads. 
but it's so seamless. Some dirty water there. Well, I was going to say these bullet scenes. I guess the, I, I didn't realize that was a shotgun shell, like a, like a spray going off. Irish Catholic, of course. Leah Thompson just did the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah, y'all look exactly alike. <laughs> That's a dog ugly hat. Here's the train station that's going to become a, a a big part of this movie, and they're showing the tracks there to set us up. Like, we know there's a train that comes through Hill Valley. Love this pan shot right there. Look at it. I believe they shot this in Sonora. There's Joe Statler, fine horses, taking it back to Hattler, uh, Statler Toyota. I think we're about to see, well, there's an old school bathhouse, which I've actually been to a bathhouse in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So shout out to Hot Springs. So we know there's a Hill Valley Festival, just like there was a Enchantment Under the Sea dance. Cabinet Maker Undertaking, we're about to see the tombstone before it's made. There it is right there, a little shot. A. Jones Manure. It's a family business. There's D. Jones Manure hauling in the 50s. You see Wells Fargo and Company, a Marshall. The building of the clock tower. I'm like looking in the background to see if there's anything that comes into focus as far as like... So I still find things in these movies that I never picked up on before. Gone to Na Hayesville for the hanging of Stinky Lomax. There's definitely some campy elements to three, but that's probably why I love it so much. And you wonder when you're shooting these movies back to back if it's, if it becomes difficult. You know, like to for the for the detail, to get the detail. So the saloon here is the same locale, you know, within the town square as Lou's and the Cafe 80s. So they shot this in Jamestown, California. There's some madams, some ladies of the night, members of the oldest profession. A spittoon that looks like he completely missed. Now that's Matt Clark. He plays Chester, the bartender. Also in here, some old Western favorites, Dub Taylor, 
Pat uh, Butram and Harry Carey Jr. Derby Bourbon. Oh, love when that dust comes off the bar. Whatever the tannin in McFly beef is, I mean... Kin to that hay barber was one I had to figure out forever, and I'm assuming it means, are, are you related to the farmer? Um, and what's that writing mean? So Marty introduced himself as Clint Eastwood, and from what I can, from what I remember, they they had to ask Clint Eastwood for permission to use his name, which I don't know if they needed to technically, or they were just doing so to be you know respectable. And uh, Clint Eastwood loved it; he thought it was funny. Tom Wilson, I literally, look at this performance. Marty doing the moonwalk. Singing Billy Jean. <laughs> so Biff's gang uh, is portrayed by uh, Christopher Wynn, Mike Watson, and Sean Sullivan. And the spit goes all over Buford. <laughs> you better run, squirrel. <laughs> Marty can do a 40 meter. I mean, he's booking it. He is booking it. Now, Tom Wilson did all the horse stunts himself in this movie, which just adds to how awesome he is. And in uh, Michael J. Fox's autobiography that he wrote in 02, Lucky Man, he said that uh, in this scene right in here, uh, he was accidentally legit hanged by getting pulled on that, and uh, he went unconscious for for a couple seconds, legitimately. Coolest Doc's ever been is right here. And he has the best dialogue ever.
It's eighty dollars. And, you know, going back to where Marty and Doc were at the uh, uh, drive-in, uh, when, when you know, Marty just talked about how Doc gave him the clothes. When he talks about Clint Eastwood, and he says, that's right, you haven't heard of him yet. If you look at the posters behind Marty on the movie, they're playing in the movie theater. It was Revenge of the Creature, uh, Tarantula, um, which uh, are two movies that Clint Eastwood were in. When he was very young. The refrigerator. Look at this thing. One of his best inventions. So this marks the trifecta for mayors. Hubert, Red, and Goldie. And um, the interesting thing about Mayor Hubert, and I actually have an interesting note on Clara here in a second, but Hubert, um, Reagan, Ronald Reagan was approached to play Hubert in the movies. Uh, obviously because of his, re he was referenced in Back to the Future 1, but he turned down the role. And so that was Hugh Gillen who took over. Uh, Reagan... Hadn't been in a movie in 30 years. God, it'd been an awesome moment, but it was a really nothing scene. So, I mean, I mean, he could have pulled it off. You know, I don't know where, you know, his physical health was at that time, but, you know, just a few, just a few lines. Look at the lip quiver. So the first of many uh, attempts to get the DeLorean up to 88. And here we go. This is the, the issue, right? This is how they're stuck in the past. No real way of how to get back to the future. First time it was flux, the flux capacitor they needed to power um, with the 1.21 gigawatts. This time they just need gas. A simple, mundane task for us now. I can go down to the gas station right now, get as many gallons as Doc would need. So Chester gave him some stuff to try.
What is this part? I don't remember. What is the what is the part of the DeLorean that gets broken? Fuel injection manifold. Can they just leave town? September the 4th. This is the Eureka moment. So I believe right now we're about to hear about the how fast the train can go. But if you look in the background, I think this is where we see Clara in a moment when they go and they look at the Eastwood Ravine. This guy did such a good job. This is Bill McKinney. And you could see in the background at that moment the clock being unloaded. I don't know if everyone caught that. The clock tower. There's Clara Clayton behind her, and there's the there's the clock. And apparently the uh train station used in this movie was also used in the nineteen eighty five film Pale Rider. The Shonash Ravine Bridge scheduled completion summer. Does it say 1886? What does it say? Summer 1886, I believe. Central Pacific Railroad. Okay, here's the info about Clara, because there she is, Mary Steenburgen's character. Um, so the, the character itself, Clara Clayton, is a reference to Clara Clemens, um, who was Mark Twain's daughter. Mark Twain's real name, Samuel Clemens, of course. Clara went on a sleigh ride with her husband, Ossip, and the horse took fright from a windswept newspaper and bolted while uh, Ossip lost control. At the top of a hill next to a 50-foot drop, the sleigh overturned, throwing Clemens out. Ossip leaped to the ground and caught the horse by the head, stopping it as it was about to plunge over the bank, dragging Clemens with her dress caught in a runner. So there you go. Clara Clayton, Clara Clemens, the origin of the name. Love at first sight. The doc was wrong. Back to the Future 3. Man, people are going to, people might jump on me for saying this, but Back to the Future 3, I think, is my favorite of the three Sylvester scores. It's very beautiful, very traditional, classic, warm, an elegance to it, a, a real beauty to the score.
Now, Mary Steenburgen and, and Chris Lloyd, this is their second time in a Western together. They did the Jack Nicholson directed and starred Going South several years earlier, which I believe was Mary Steenburgen's first movie ever. And while I'm thinking about it, I got to give a shout out to Scoutmaster, who is a former sponsor of this show, hopefully a, a future sponsor. But um, he wrote me this and he said, because uh, because this movie is often credited as Chris Lloyd's first on-screen kiss. But according to Scoutmaster, he had a kiss in 1984's Joy of Sex, a movie I haven't heard of. It happens about the 36-minute mark. Clayton Ravine. I mean, yeah and no. So Saturday, September 5th, 1885, this was a 34 years to the day, uh, 34 years later to the day my grandfather would be born, L.V. Hughes. So shout out. So we have Carson Spur here. We have the callback to part one with the, uh, the DeLorean time machine model. I know people love railroad train sets and stuff like this. If anybody can knows how to recreate this, I might make room for this. This is the coolest thing ever. Couldn't be simpler. Come on, man. All right. It's just so romantic. The doc is just so romantic here. They're binding their plants. Always love this line, even though how corny it is, I love it. Everything becomes clear. I have a lot of love for Christopher Lloyd. Obviously, he's a goat.
of acting. I've said it for a long time. I told him that he's my favorite actor of all time. I mean, you think about Clue the Movie, Page Master, Who Framed, Taxi, Adam's Family, Back to the Future. Um, he's had some great one-offs here in recent years in different films. But I'll be honest, he's not like a traditional leading man would be the nice way to say it. So he's kind of out kicking his coverage with Mary Steenburgen who's a great beauty. There's Mayor Hubert. In the clock tower, we celebrate. So this is a uh, a fun scene here, and I had to take a pause a moment ago. So I hope for I'm, I'm right there on. But the man who just said "ready, gentlemen," um, that is Dean Cundy, the director of photography, and. Coincidentally, or not coincidentally, but ironically, he plays the photographer. And right there is ZZ Top, the legends, Dusty Hill, Billy Gibbons, Frank Beard. Frank Beard, the one without the beard. He has the stash. Again, this to me is a further illustration there's Burton Gillum. But to me, you know, there's the dance, right? And something happens at the dance. It's, again, a lot like the first movie where they have the Enchantment Under the Sea dance. And, you know, it's where uh, 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 Lorraine and, and George... First fall in love, and Emmett and Clara here have a similar thing. Mary Bur- Steenburge rocking that uh, uh, pin, the lapel pin, the brooch that she gives Emmett later. I have a replica of that um, that says Clara and has you know the flower and everything with it. Really like it. I wear it you know with suits all the time. People ask me what it is, and I say it's uh, from Back to the Future 3, and then they stare at me a little awkwardly, but it's all right. Myself, similar to uh, Marty here, I was always surprised that the doc could dance. Even a baby could handle that weapon. (laughs) What do we feel? Y'all tweet me. What do you think about Marty's um, character arc in 2 and 3? Because even though people claim that he didn't have one in Back to the Future 1, he obviously did. Um, It was resolved by the end of the movie. He was kind of afraid, got over his fear of rejection by proxy of his father, felt comfortable to send things off to the record companies. But, um... Great sell job by Burton. But what do we think about his his character arc of not being able to be called a kid or a, a chicken or or things of that nature? Do we like that? Do we like that he's a bit of a hothead? I guess he is Irish, which is known a known trait of my people.
who's going to make us tenderfoot? Marshall Strickland. Now, there's a deleted scene. There's a couple deleted scenes from Back to the Future 3. Um, I don't know exactly where some of them fall. There's a still that you can find online of um, Marty and, and Doc with the time machine kind of on some big old wagon wheels with a couple of horses probably getting it out to the uh, open field so that they could um, you know try to get the DeLorean up to 88 with the horses. The other one, Biff Tannen kills, or not Biff, but Buford Tannen kills Marshall Strickland. But they cut that one out too, and he cuts it out in broad day, so I'm not sure where that may have happened. Kind of remnant of Back to the Future 2 right here, of course. Where um, Biff and gang try to get the leather jacketed and, and hatted Marty McFly, Calvin Klein. And then they say, well, he got up on stage. How does he change clothes so fast? Biff and gang have an ire for a particular target in Buford and gang. The same shot in the back by Buford Na- Tannen. That's why Doc says Tannen, you're early. By supper time Monday. <laughs> what a tool. I have subtitles on here, and I bet you can do some that's worth $80. And some of the stuff I guess I just didn't pick up on before. He calls Emmett Smithy. Why have I never picked up on that? Threw her down. No. I damn you. Great. Then Marty interrupts what was supposed to happen. Again, like he did in Back to the Future 1, where he interrupts his parents' first meeting. He now interrupts Biff killing Doc. Now, this one we like, but what happens? It now puts Marty in the same position, and here it is now. The character arc. He can't resist being called inferior of any kind. Like you can't be, you can't call him yellow. You can't call him chicken. You can't say you're scared. I think this might be categorized as toxic masculinity.
Eight o'clock. I do my killing after breakfast. Great line. Dusty Hill, Billy Gibbons, and Frank Beard were great Houstonians. I actually went to Dusty Hill's house um, on the outskirts in the greater Houston area, and uh, it, it was incredible. I mean, the guest house had to be at least 8,000 square feet when the main home was probably in the 20s or 30s. It was, it was massive. He had big gates at the front of his house that had a, a DH you know, engraved into the gate or cut out into the gate in this big kind of calligraphy-looking font. Wait. Frisbee, four out. I like how Marty invents the Frisbee. Oh, peacemaker. Another great Texan, Burton Gillum. Shout out to Burton. Hope you're doing well, my friend. I think the split cam here is excellent. How they shot that, you know, it's still, it's a marvel to me. They developed the technology ILM did to use the same actor in the same shot playing different characters. Um, they created the camera to do that, specific, specifically for Back to the Future 2 and 3 because the production was an 11-month 11 mo 11 production all around for both movies. Oh, is that the schoolhouse that she teaches at? She lives in the same yard as the, as the school. See, when you when you put these movies on all the time, you 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 start to not look at the film itself, but literally everything in the auxiliary, like the windmill and the the smoke coming out of the chimney and the schoolhouse that's right there. Okay. Wow, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea came out in 1875. Is that accurate? Let's see. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is a great book. A lot of great renditions of it. 20,000 Leagues. Well, they first produced a film of it in 1916. Good Lord. Based on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Actually, here we go. Publication date. March 1869 through June 1870 as a serial, and then in 1870 as, in a book form. But, of course, Jules Verne was French, 
So it was translated to English and published in 1872. Still, you know, you have a little bit of an advantage, a little, little bit of a disparity in years. But Doc has the advantage, what I was about to say, with this Rube Goldberg experiment that he has to make the breakfast in the mornings. A little, little, little cheekage there from Michael J. Doc's shop in this movie... It might be my favorite, but I, I say that I because I just really love Back to the Future 3. Like, on a very different level. In classic movie lines, Marty feeling himself a little bit wearing that cult peacemaker. So now he's a local celebrity. Even the uh, the preacher wants him to uh, kill him, and there's the clock tower in the background, the clock from the clock tower. Here's the Undertaker. And he actually kind of looks like The Undertaker, the wrestler. W.J. Chang. Looks like a Chinese individual. There's the Clara pin that I had the replica of, although that one looks a lot better, let me be honest. Mine's plastic. The bullet hole still in Doc's hat. And there it is, the tombstone. What does it say? Is there any other writings on there? The man who played The Undertaker is phenomenal. I love how he puts his hand on top of Marty's head and like figures out where it is on his neck. There's a Stetson advertisement in the back, which, of course, they're the hat makers still today. They make a lot of the Western-style hats. <sighs> Dissension between Marty and Doc. I'm surprised that Marty just dropped that so easily. If somebody told you they knew what was going to happen to you in the future, you wouldn't... I'd be a little bit more involved. Like, I'd want to know more. I'd keep talking. I'd say, Doc, no, you can't do this to me. I gotta know. <laughs> What's going on, man?
There's the DeLorean on the tracks. And we are we are almost there, guys. We are almost ready to go back to the future. Wow, Marty and I said that at the same time. Like literally at the same exact time. I'm not in my home office, so if, if you hear me shuffling around or you hear sounds, um, it's because I'm recording this on the road. Doc, depressed. We're burning fireplace here, knocking on the door. Man, this scene was such a heartbreaker for me when I would watch it as a kid. Of her to uh, how, how she turns on Emmett. I mean, obviously, she can't believe him. But she just turns on him so hard here. And it just it breaks your heart to watch it and watch what it does to Emmett. Oh, wow. Sorry, I, I was just uh, sent a bit of pro wrestling news. That's a little shocking, but we'll see what happens. How can you believe this, though, if you're Clara? Man, look at Emmett's face, too. Doc is just... But I, it's not the truth. Oh. I know for the sake of the movie, they couldn't, you know, do this, but. If I were Doc, like literally, if this was really happening to me in real life, I would have um, said, look, I will show you. And I was showing her the DeLorean. I guess there would have repercussions of showing her that. But at the same time, he already told her that he's from the future. So this would just confirm it. Ugh. We've all been there, Doc. We've all been there. Whiskey. So 
So this guy right here, the barbed wire salesman, he um, is supposed to be a guy named John Wayne Gates. Uh, John Warren Gates, excuse me. And he was a salesman for the Southern Wire Company of St. Louis. And then eventually that merged uh, to form the Braddock Wire Company. And they were a consolidated steel and wire company in the late 1880s, around the time this was going on. Um, and with a guy from Chicago who was an attorney, his name was uh, Albert Henry Gary. They created the monopoly, a monopoly, in the U.S. wire industry in 1898 with the American Steel and Wire Company. They only ran the company for a couple of years before they sold it to J.P. Morgan, who um, added it to become you know the largest U.S. steel conglomerate, you know, in the country. And then John Warren Gates went on to form and found the Texas company, which we know as Texaco. And this is where it kind of all comes full circle because we know of the Texaco service stations in 1955 and 2015 that we see in the movie. Run for fun. What kind of hell of a fun is that? I love those guys. They're so funny. Where else could he be saying? Prattfall. Boom, and a great one. Fifteen till the hour where they're supposed to do it. So this is something I never understood about Clara. Is she's so heartbroken? She wants to take a one-way ticket to San Francisco. Is she just going to leave her home and all her students? So what do we have here? Wake up juice. A version of this is in the uh, Hill Valley cookbook that you can get by Allison Robicelli. Why do we have to cut these things so damn close? I literally say to my wife every time we get to the airport because <laughs> I'm always freaked out. We're going to be late. Ooh, that looks hot. I've heard Joanna Johnston talk about the costumes that Claire was wearing, this very beautiful violet get-up. She was the only pop of color in this whole town, and the sun was so hot on the filming locations 
literally you could see it in the dailies the uh, the velvet or the the violet dress would turn like a to a lighter pink uh because of this the heat the extreme heat Seven fifty five, actually. Ooh, and there we see the picture. It turns to here lies Clint Eastwood. So this is where Marty has to learn that it's okay to be afraid. Or not, or not be afraid. Well, B is afraid. Look at the fear in his eyes. But not just be afraid, but be okay with people calling you names. Biggest yellow belly in the West. I'd probably be like Doc. I've never had a drop of alcohol in my life. I'd probably pass right out if I ever had a shot of whiskey. You gutless yellow pie slinger. One of my favorite lines. Got a back door to this place? Uh, Yeah, it's in the back. (laughs) Another line I've used. So the locomotive you're looking at there, of course, we're about to see a lot of it. Um, But it is the Sierra Number 3, and it actually recently returned to service at Railroad 1897 State Historic Park, which is also known as the Movie Railroad in California. Had a huge overhaul. Great timing for my guy.
Well, no crap, Sherlock. They actually show that clip of uh, Claire on a lot of the uh, Universal Backlot tour rides when they're you know talking about the track, the tram, you know, show her stopping the train. Which has to be like such a crazy thing that anybody can just pull the thing. I mean, I know pulling it for the bus stop because I've ridden the you know public metro here in Houston before, and you pull the thing for the bus stop. But to be able to stop the entire train at any time you want, safety hazard. So, okay, if you remember in Back to the Future 2, Marty is watching a uh, crazy, uh, I guess you say Trump Biff Tannen in, back in the, uh, 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 in the tower when he's with the two naked women in the hot tub, and they see they're watching a, a Clint Eastwood movie, one of the Fistful of Dollars trilogy, I believe. And we know that Marty is sees... Clint Eastwood have a bulletproof vest because he comments on it. Bulletproof vest. God's a genius, you know. Um, and that was such a great scene here. And a bulletproof vest actually appears in each of the three movies in the trilogy. In the first one, Doc wears the bulletproof vest to be a, avoid being killed by the Libyans. In the second one, Biff Tannen's watching A Fistful of Dollars from 1964. Uh, in which the man with no name wears the steel plate underneath his poncho. And then, boom, in this movie, Marty emulates that scene by wearing a cast iron stove cover or door under his clothing to avoid being killed by Mad Dog Tannen. Breaks the tombstone so we know that Marty will no longer be Killed, and here's the punch. Just like George falls into the manure, some fresh manure too. And in the making of Back to the Future 3, they said the manure consisted of mainly horse-fed pellets, uh, horse-feed pellets, Noting that the pellets going in and going out of the horse pretty much look the same. <laughs> Ugh. And it disappears. So now Doc and Marty are off to commandeer the plane. Now, here's Clara, and you can kind of see the dress looks a little bit more pink than it did. It almost changes colors here, and now it's a little more purple. She has a similar Clara brooch almost over her neck, it looks like, and she sees the time machine model now it validates in her mind, that, that Emmett was telling the truth. But see, if, like I was saying earlier, if I was Emmett, I would have just, boom, taken her right to the time machine. I would have shown her.
after they commandeer the train, it's a science experiment. Doc's bandana is made from the shirt that he wore in Back to the Future 2. You know, in any other person's hands, this would have been frightening, right? But you trust the dot got his math right. Even though he, you know all of his experiments have not always panned out or worked, you trust that he got his math right. Because one, one small change, right? Like one small issue here. One small miscalculation could have meant, um, you know, they die. <laughs> it's crazy. Let's see. So, you know, there's that. All right. Little house there. This is where we see. Yep, there she comes. Clara Clayton. Speeding on down the path. The walkies coming in handy again. Or are these different walkies? Are these different walkies with a different battery source on them? Or are these the same walkies with a with a 1885 battery? What is this going on here? October 27, 1985. You know, I was just watching Death Becomes Her, which was a Robert Zemeckis movie. We went to this outdoor theater in um, in Houston. It's like out top, on top of a building, whatever, whatever. We saw Death Becomes Her, and, and, and in the movie, Meryl Streep's character asked Goldie Hawn's character when she took the potion, and spoiler alert, it was October 26, 1985. Zemeckis directed, so it makes sense. Expedi exposition here, setting up that you need it to get to the, the hot. <laughs> Boom. Look at Mary Steenburgen just flying on the back there. She loved her man. One of the effects I always loved in this movie, man, were the green, the yellow, and the red smoke of the locomotive, the steam coming out of those logs, those different colored logs that were about to get the fire as hot as damnation itself. Doc registers. Clara calling out for him. Some ILM trickery with that smoke there, you could tell. When these movies from the 80s, when the 4K releases come out and you have HD televisions, you can you can tell more of the effect shots than you could before, but there's the yellow smoke going. The speedometer's getting up to 88. Yeah, I need to look into this. I hear there's a... Uh a mode for your Tesla that something happens when you get up to 88. Like there's like a back to the future mode. Does anybody else know about that? My mother-in-law has a Tesla. I might need to 
investigate. Doc's thinking. The door's open. We're almost to the to the to the red there. We're still in the the yellow mode. Oh, she's trying to come up with it. What she got to do? No. You know, even though I've seen this movie so much, the tension still gets to me of this scene. This scene was so well done, so well executed. <laughs> Point of no return. Got to make it happen, Doc. He wants Claire to come with him. It goes against everything about his character. And I've actually seen people online talk about, why would the doc allow her to come with her? It goes against everything he believes in. He lectures Marty for bringing information from the future back to the past. Why, why, how, I mean, this is irresponsible for him to bring something from the past to the future. And you're absolutely a thousand percent, couldn't be more on the ball, you nailed it. But here's the thing. You know what would make Doc do all that? You know what would make him do all these crazy things? There's a word for it. There's a phrase for it. The thing that makes him do that? <laughs> it's the power of love. And here it is. Boom! Red smoke time. Oh, yeah, baby. It's a wrap now. Whew. Yeah, this sequence is so well done. Zemeckis really did have an eye for action. If you think about Romancing the Stone, some great action sequences in there. There's some really fun physical action sequences in Death Becomes Her, of course, Back to the Future trilogy. There's some stuff in Roger Rabbit. He has that eye for action and suspense. And he even mentioned that in one of the uh, making of commentaries for Back to the Future 3 about how he understood why filmmakers loved shooting movies on a train because it's a track and there's a story. You know. We're almost there. Slipper the hoverboard. Oh, this scene you would break my heart as a kid. Because he got him there. He gets Clara. We're almost to 88. We're about to go off. The end of the track is coming. Tension is building. Catches her. You see again that dress is just different colors all over, all over the place. Great special effects shot. Doc flies off of Clara. And I'm like, wait a minute. You got to get the Doc. When I was a kid, I was like, you got to get the doc. But Marty says, hi-ho, silver. And boom. Perfectly timed. Fire trails. And here comes the locomotive. Now, this was done as a model. This is a model locomotive. You can't tell. It's a beautiful model. So well done. They need to bring back this, you know, model movie making. Like, you know, like not Godzilla quality, but quality like this.
and there's a sign that says Eastwood Ravine. What flag is that flying? Are those just... I've never noticed those flags before. Pull in front of the Hilldale Housing Development, where we know Marty lives later. I didn't get what was happening when Marty saw everybody getting out of their cars. And he's like, hey, whatever, man. I just got back to the future. This is probably the best way to dismantle and destroy as Doc wanted. I know I did my rewatchables earlier in this podcast. Unanswerable questions. Or maybe this is answerable. Did the locomotive not have time to stop? Was that just like a non-starter? We couldn't do it? Because it seems like you could have stopped. That's all I'm saying. And I think what's going on is not only are we sad as an audience to see the DeLorean, which is really the third main character of all these movies, finally get destroyed. It was sad. Um, But also you're recognizing on Marty's face that this is it for Doc. He knows there's no way he can rebuild the time machine. So Doc's stuck forever. And that's what we as the audience are starting to realize. Biff back to being nice guy. Because remember last time Marty saw Biff at this point, if my continuity is correct, is when he was crazy terrorist Biff. Well, he wasn't a terrorist. But Biff horrific. There's Jeff Weisman with Leah Thompson, Wendy Joe Sperber, Mark McClure. So we're kind of back in the <laughs> we're kind of back in the uh, end of the first movie, and you saw Crispin Glover's, well, it's not Crispin Glover, Jeffrey Weissman portraying Crispin Glover, portraying George McFly. They kept him at a distance. You never saw him too close up. A lot of people still have no idea that he wasn't in the second and third. Just crazy. Here's Elizabeth Shue. See what I mean by the differences between Clara and Jennifer? Jennifer literally spent the majority of the movie passed out in the DeLorean in an alleyway or then passed out here. Small part, but yeah, she was she did it. She was in it. I've always loved the Red Hot Chili Peppers. It's always been a favorite band of mine. And obviously, Flea has always been one of the coolest bass players alive. Maybe ever. I don't know. Him and Gene Simmons. I don't know who else. Who else you put on the bass player list? He's up there, though. And um, it's funny that he was just randomly kind of in these movies. Flea's on my wish list to interview. Flea, Billy Zane, Michael J., Tom Wilson, Elizabeth Shue. Bob Zemeckis, those are some of my remainings I want to really get. If anybody has any contact with any one of those people out there, let me know. There's Flea. So this is going back to what we first heard about in Back to the Future 2, the incident with the Rolls Royce. Overacting award, actually. Changing that, Flea has the overacting award. 
I was. I don't know if I got to overacting. Doc, my act, overacting award in the rewatchables pod is uh, Doc overreacts, overacts. You know, Chris Brown, uh, Chris Brown, <laughs> Christopher Lloyd. Whenever they give him the wake up juice, and Tom Wilson just as Buford, the nature of the character overacts. But an actual overacting performance would be Flea here, over the top. There's the Rolls Royce. Just funny how one incident could lead you back to that. And it erased. I think that means that Marty never works for the company. Mm, that'd be a good question for Bob Gale. Does the fact that it completely erases... Like it did the tombstone where the tombstone goes away means no one died. Does the facts completely erasing mean that he never works there and becomes a famous rock star? Interesting to think about. Also, why do the train track things go down here? This is nitpicking, right? Picking nits, but I'm just wondering. Oh, boom. There we go. Time train. Look how beautiful it is beautiful. I noticed that it aged the worst, and it just just the idea of Doc gets stuck and he invents a time travel train. But it looks awesome. I might have to recant that statement. Jules Verne had to come back for Eini. Cute kids. One thing that did not age the worst, Doc Brown's suit game is on fire. The gloves, the bow tie. I mean, he's really operating on another level here. Now we're about to realize that Doc had already, were you going back to the future? Nope. Already been there. And this is where we find out that Doc, before I guess he came back to the present, he got the hover conversion? Unanswerable question. And boom, into the movie. And there you have it, the end of Back to the Future Part 3 of the Back to the Future Trilogy. And unfortunately, my friends, this is the end of Back to the Future Seas the podcast, Season 9. Incredible that we did another 14 episodes some great guests this season. I actually want to take this time to thank all of my guests for season nine of Back to the Future, the podcast. I have to give a big shout out to Steve Franks, Allison Robicelli, Dan Abrams, Burrell and Marsha Gilmore, of course, uh, Angela, Tony, and Daz. 
Got to give big shout outs to William Ramsey, Jeff Smith, Burton Gillum, uh, Francis Lee McCain, Jimmy Fallon, Cassine Gaines, Laker Jim's Fletch Cast, Jay Leno. What a lineup this season on Back to the Future, the podcast. We're going to be back for season 10. Be on the lookout for that. I'm hoping we're kind of rounding up the year of, of 2022. Maybe in December, I might come back or it might be early 2023, but it's been awesome to be rocking with you all on a pretty much a weekly basis, a semi-weekly basis since May. We've had a fun time. Back to the Future the Podcast. Season 9 is in the books. Season 10 is around the corner. Want to make sure you subscribe, follow, review, rate, do all the things you're supposed to do. Um, I really appreciate the pinheads out here. Y'all make this show worth continuing doing. I love talking about Back to the Future, but more so I love that you all have found an audience with me and we get to talk about it together. So, for the final time in Season 9 of Back to the Future, the podcast, I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. This is Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time for his film trilogy of all time. And I will see you in the future.